Let me ask you a question. Can we differentiate this? Well, yeah, we can use the power rule from the second video. How about this? Uh, well, yeah, we can use the exponential rule from the last video. How about this? Mm, no, it doesn't seem like it. Clearly, we still lack some kind of information on differentiation that prevents us from differentiating more complicated functions. So now, we need to expand our knowledge. We need to learn further derivative rules. Let's deconstruct the basic structure of equations. There exists an infinite number of possible relationships between x and y, but they all follow five simple principles. Addition, multiplication, exponentiation, special functions such as trig, and composition of functions, a combination of the few. If we could define all of these derivative rules, then we could theoretically differentiate every single possible equation. So you have the basic idea. All we need now is to actually find all the derivative rules. Let's start. One rule at a time. The first rule to learn is the most straightforward, the additive rule. It's pretty simple. The derivative of an addition is equal to the derivative of the individual components. Now this channel is called in a nutshell for a reason, so I'm not going to explain in full detail why this rule works the way it does, but if you want to know, then here's the quick proof. Alright, now on to the next rule. This next rule is slightly more complicated to remember, but still manageable. The multiplicative rule. Although I could just give you this rule, I believe that the much more elaborate option would be to explore the proof behind it. Let's take two sides of a rectangle with length fx and gx, its area being their multiplication. If we shift x by a small change, dx, then three new shapes are created. As we shrink dx to zero, remember the limit, this square's area becomes zero times zero, which, of course, is zero. It completely disappears and leaves us with two new rectangles. This one has lengths of fx and the difference in gx, or dg, while this one has lengths of gx and the difference in fx, or df. The total change in area, the difference in fx plus gx, or dy, because we're trying to calculate the function of x, is equal to both of these changes added together. Divide both sides by dx, because we're trying to calculate the change in y with respect to x. This leaves us with an addition of two multiplications, which we can write in Lagrange notation like this. Now I'm sure that this part of the video is perhaps the part that you've been waiting for, the trigonometric rules. It may seem intimidating, but if we break it down, we could definitely define a rule for something like sine, cos, or even tan. Before we get carried away by the secant, the cosecant, the cotangent, the arcsine, etc., let's just focus on the first and most basic function, sine. Let's just observe the graph. It starts at 0, and goes up to 1, and goes back down. At the beginning, it definitely has a positive derivative. Then it slows down, reaches 0, and starts decreasing, meaning it has a negative derivative. Is there any graph that pops into mind when we think of this? Starts positive, goes to 0, and goes negative. You know, it kind of reminds me of cos, doesn't it? But how do we know it's definitely cos? It could be literally any other graph. Maybe some entirely new function, even. To complete your calculus course, you don't actually need to know this proof. 
but I believe it still enriches the overall comprehension if we explore it. Take the classic unit circle with radius 1. Let x represent its angle, and the sine of x represents its height. Let's change the angle by a small nudge, dx, then its new height is sine of x plus dx. Due to the property of the unit circle, x is not only the value of the angle in radians, but also the length of the arc. Similarly, think of dx not as the change in angle, but the change in the length of the arc. Now, riddle me this. What shape is an arc of length dx? The obvious answer would be, it's curved. But think again. If we zoom in on a circle, it's evident that it approaches a line rather than a curved shape. If we zoom in infinitely, it would theoretically become a line. Alright, so why does this matter? Well, the arc of length dx, as dx approaches zero, is actually just no more and no less than a straight line. Not just any straight line though. If we add two lines to create a right angled triangle, this triangle just so happens to be similar to the triangle created by the radius. This means that the side length that it is increasing by is equal to cos x dx. If the difference in sin x is equal to cos x dx, then the derivative of sin x is equal to cos x. Just for a little thought experiment, try to see if you can derive the rule of cos x using a similar proof. It's time for the rule that's the last, but definitely not the least. The rule that allows us to combine functions. We call this the chain rule, and it allows us to derive more complicated functions, such as this or this. Let's take the sine of x squared. How do we find this derivative? If we split this function into two other functions in the form of f of gx, what does fx and gx equal? Well, gx would obviously equal x squared, and fx would equal the sine of x. Rather than thinking of gx as a function of x, let's think about it as its own unique variable, h. In this case, the original function sine of x squared becomes the sine of h. If we calculate the difference in the sine of h, we know that it is equal to cos h multiplied by the difference in h. Divided by dx, and it becomes the derivative of sine h multiplied by the derivative of h. Replace h with gx, and the chain rule becomes a multiplication of two derivatives. We can also write this in Lagrange notation, which for me makes the rule a lot easier to remember. With every derivative rule done, let's try deriving a function, the sine of x squared plus 2x plus 1. It may seem intimidating, but if we break it down, there is nothing out of our skill level. First of all, we need to apply the chain rule in order to separate sine from the quadratic polynomial. Let fx equal sine x and gx equal x squared plus 2x plus 1. This means that the derivative of sine of x squared plus 2x plus 1 is equal to the derivative of sine, which we know is cos of gx, or cos of x squared plus 2x plus 1, multiplied by the derivative of x squared plus 2x plus 1. We can take the derivative of each individual term, this is 2x through the power rule, 2 through the power rule, and 0 through the power rule. The final derivative is equal to the cosine of x squared plus 2x plus 1 multiplied by 2x plus 2, which we can factorize to make it look a bit prettier. Alright, that was a long video. It's finally recap time. We went through the additive, multiplicative, trigonometric, and chain rules of differentiation. After all of that, you can finally say that I know how to differentiate every possible function. Have a good day.